Welcome to our webinar this afternoon presented by the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools. Um, today the webinar will be looking at uh, promoting early childhood development and well-being with the early years check-in and play and learn uh, presented by Dr. Anthony Levinson and Dr. Kalpen and Nair. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we jump in. Um, this is a new webinar platform for us, so um, please let us know if you are having any issues. Uh, we do recommend, where possible, uh, use a wired internet connection. Um, and if you do have any issues, you can send a private message to the admin. Um, the admin is in the chat as National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. Um, we have uh, lovely Isabel behind there, and she will be able to talk you through any tech issues that you have. We ask that you use the chat to post any questions or comments throughout the webinar. Um, our preference is that you use the chat box and not the Q&A. Um, it helps keep, keep our, our conversation on track. Um, you can send any questions um, about the, the webinar content through the chat. And again, any tech issues through a private message to the admin if you're able. So thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we're very excited to get started today. Uh, we'll start with one of our first polling questions here. Um, this question used to be a bit more relevant uh, when we knew that people were joining webinars in groups. Um, so the first question is asking how many people are watching today's session with you? Uh, we're just hoping to get a sense of how big our audience is today. Um, I see that we have, um, I think, just over 30, almost 40 people um, logged on, um, and it looks like most people are joining solo, which I think is, is pretty par for the course for, for these times. Um, a couple of small groups. Um, so just make sure that you select your option and that you hit submit so that your answer is recorded. Um, thank you so much to everybody for, for those responses. Uh, we have another polling question, uh, number two of three. Um, we're just interested to know um, how familiar are you with the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools website? Um, have you been to our website? Have you used our resources before? Um, we're just trying to get a sense of, you know, people who are um, maybe new to using some of the NCCMT resources or some people who may be more experienced. Um, helps get us a sense of, of the audience that's joining us today. Um, looks like the answer's coming in. It's about a uh, 30-60 uh, uh, split, roughly. 30% um, have seen have been using our resources, and the other two-thirds have, have not. So uh, really exciting to, to see so many, I guess, new people joining us today. Um, and we do hope that uh, you enjoy this webinar and find it useful. And then the last of our polling questions for right now, um, for those of you who have used our resources, uh, we're just curious to know um, how familiar you are and how many times you have used resources in the past, um, whether it's been one time or um, two to three times um, more than that, or, or if you use it uh, very, very frequently. So um, again, this really helps us get a sense of our audience that's joining us and we can uh, fine tune webinars as well in the future. So looks like we have a couple people who've been using, you know, from the two, three, four uh, times um, and a couple people in the uh, 10 plus times range. So that's really exciting for us to see. So uh, thank you so much for, for your responses there. So getting back to the, the webinar content, um, I'm very excited to be presenting to you from the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, uh, working remotely, of course. Um, we are actually one of six National Collaborating Centers across Canada. Um, the National Collaborating Centers were established following the SARS outbreak now um, over a decade ago um, in order to help support public health in efforts to uh, be flexible and uh, really address the needs of public health practitioners across the country um, when situations arise, um, as well as for more day-to-day, um, -day, you know, the normal uh, public health functions as well. Um, so across the country, we're all spread out in, in different cities across the country from, from coast to coast. Um, but we do all act uh, nationally in scope. Uh, so in case it's difficult to read on your screen, uh, we've got the National Collaborating Centre for Indigenous Health, uh, out in BC, as well as the Center for Environmental Health, also in BC, uh, Infectious Diseases in, in Winnipeg, uh, Determinants of Health in Antigonish, uh, Nova Scotia, um, the Center for Healthy Public Policy is in Montreal, Quebec, um, and we are located in Hamilton, Ontario, although now our staff are joining from all over. <laughs> 
Um, our mandate, um, so while the other NCCs focus more specifically on uh, specific topic areas in public health, uh, at the NCCMT, we focus more on methods and tools that can support um, the use of evidence uh, for evidence-informed decision-making in public health um, that can be applied then to all areas in public health. Uh, we do this through a number of different ways. We host a registry of methods and tools. These are methods and tools that can support all steps of using an evidence-informed approach. We offer uh, quite a few online learning opportunities. Um, we host workshops um, and are available for workshops on demand. Um, we've done a number of them now since COVID online and those have gone pretty well. So uh, obviously adapting there, but those are still available. Uh, we run a site called uh, Public Health Plus, where you can find uh, pre-appraised uh, synthesized evidence for public health topics. We host a number of video series, including one called Understanding Research Evidence. Um, this is a series of uh, quick five to seven minute long uh, videos that go over different aspects of, of evidence-informed decision-making, statistical concepts, um, in a really easy to understand but non-condescending way. Um, I'll admit I always look anytime I need to, to do anything with a standardized mean difference, I'll rewatch the video and feel a lot more confident moving forward. Um, and of course, we do quite a bit of networking and outreach, uh, making sure that public health is aware of what we have to offer um, and using our resources. Uh, so enough about the NCCMT. Uh, today, I am very excited to present our uh, presenters who are joining us. Um, Dr. Anthony Levinson is a uh, associate professor and John Evans chair in health sciences education research. Um, he's the director of the division of e-learning innovation at McMaster University. Uh, he's an expert in online learning and technology enhanced knowledge translation. Um, he holds extensive experience with design, development, implementation, dissemination, and evaluation of consumer health education resources and e-learning. Um, for over 10 years, Anthony has provided leadership for the development of online learning tools and resources for healthcare professionals, earlier professionals, and the public related to Ontario's enhanced 18-month well baby visit and developmental surveillance initiative uh, for the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services. Um, he also maintains an active clinical practice in the area of medical psychiatry with a special interest in neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, not entirely sure how you sleep there, Anthony. <laughs> um, Dr. Kalpananer um, is a research associate in the McMaster School of Nursing. Um, she co-led the Development Surveillance Initiative um, and oversaw the development, testing, and implementation of the early years check-in. Um, Kalpana has extensive experience in qualitative research methods, program implementation, and program evaluation. Um, she has worked on a range of projects and programs in the areas of primary care, early childhood development, and more recently, cardiovascular nursing. Um, so with that, I am very excited to hand it over to um, Dr. Levinson and Dr. Nair for your presentations. Thank you so much, Emily, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for having us. We're gonna we're gonna dive right in to some uh, scenario based learning. So imagine for a moment that you are in charge of one of Ontario's early on child and family centers, or uh, maybe you have a comparable one in your jurisdiction that's focused on engaging uh, parents and children and early child development. And you are thinking that you would like to implement the early years check-in. It's a simple tool. We're gonna talk quite a lot about it today. 11 items, a way of gauging uh, and engaging parents in a conversation about uh, child development in a number of key domains. So you'd like to implement this tool. Maybe you're thinking about using it to better establish rapport. Maybe you're thinking about it as a way of uh, gauging whether or not parents are concerned about their child's development. And you'd like to uh, run this and train your staff in how to use this simple to use tool. So you download the implementation toolkit, which gives you ideas about how to do it. It gives uh, uh, links so that your staff can go through online training uh, related to both the developmental surveillance initiative 
and the early years check-in. It also, the implementation toolkit also has uh, posters and things that you can do to promote use of the EYCI uh, within the early years center. Now your staff are equipped and uh, when you're seeing parents uh, in, in your center or engaging with them online, because many have had to transition to using uh, virtual tools if they've had less uh, contact during the pandemic, uh, you can engage, uh, engage a parent online with the EYCI. Uh, they've, they've done their check-in and you now have a sense that the parent is maybe concerned about their child's use of language. At the end of the tool, there are actually suggestions for games and activities from uh, a related uh, endeavor, which we'll also talk about today called Play and Learn, which would have games and activities that uh, the parent could do uh, to work on some of the language skills and language development with their child. Or maybe at the center, you might print out an activity or direct a parent to a specific activity to foster uh, development in some of the areas of concern. Regardless, this is how people might implement and have uh, a guided conversation between parents and early years professionals um, in, a, in a scenario such as uh, an early on child and family center. So that's one very plausible scenario. And uh, we're going to be putting some meat on that uh, on those bones and telling you in quite a bit more detail uh, about the developmental surveillance initiative and um, about the early years check in and those associated tools. Uh, I think uh, Emily gave a fairly detailed introduction. So I don't know how much more there is to say about us other than uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the the history uh, and background uh, behind the uh, developmental surveillance initiative in terms of how I first got involved. Most of my involvement with uh, these projects relates to the online learning and technology knowledge translation side of things, not with my uh, psychiatrist hat. Uh, but as you can see, there's a lot of uh, overlap between trying to better understand uh, brain and behavior and early child development. So I'll leave it about uh, I'll leave it there for me uh, from that standpoint. I'm not sure if Cal has anything more that she'd like to say uh, in background. Um, you know what? I think Emily covered it. I, I think I'll just add that I this work started many years ago. I joined the project, I think 2014, 2015. So it's been many different stages and phases of work to get us to the place that we're at. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit more in depth about some of those early days in terms of the validation of the tool and and sort of where we've why we've ended up at the place that we've ended up. And and I think um, it's important. I mean, we we have maybe one acknowledgement slide at the end, but mm -hmm. uh, as Cal's saying, this is work that's been happening over many years and really on the backs of a number of people who have uh, shown great leadership in this area, uh, not just in the province of Ontario, but um, um, in across the country. And we're, we're really fortunate at McMaster to have had many people over the years at the Offord Centre and the Inch Lab who have uh, participated in, in this work and, and kind of continuing to foster early child development. And uh, so we'll, we'll hopefully name some names and you'll see some names along the way for people who have uh, published some of the scholarly work. But uh, this is, uh, in, in every respect, a, a team effort. Uh, so we're just the spokespeople today of the work that's gone on, and we're both very invested in it. But uh, hopefully along the way, we can give some acknowledgments. And and it's uh, I wanted to say as well that we've been fortunate to receive uh, funding for this work from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services in Ontario. But uh, I guess the caveat would be they're allowed to get credit, but not blame. So you know, this is still uh, independent work and work in progress. And uh, you know we're we're fortunate in the in the province of Ontario that there has been these efforts to continue to invest in in early child development. So 
Um, we're going to uh, sort of scoot through some background in terms of the structure today. Uh, Cal's going to talk more about this concept of developmental surveillance and do a much deeper dive on the development of the early years check-in known to his friends as the EYCI. And then I'll quickly uh, talk and just show you some of the other tools. There is a handout that has all of the links to these core resources that we'll be talking about today. So don't worry about uh, jotting down um, all the URLs. I might uh, throw some of the URLs into the chat as well, but there's the, a link to the handout uh, uh, as well that was just posted in the chat pod, which has all the links. Um, you know, by the end of uh, the webinar, uh, hopefully you'll have a pretty good understanding of the rationale and the development process uh, for the EYCI, understand a little bit more about how that fits into this concept of developmental surveillance and some of the other tools. Uh, and I hope you'll be uh, enthusiastic to uh, check them out and think about uh, whether there's a role for implementation within uh, your context. I, I don't know that I understand fully all of the different ways in which um, the world of public health and early child development intersect. So I'd be happy if uh, during some of the questions and interactions, it would be helpful for us to understand a little bit about where uh, people's interest in this uh, comes from. But you know, there are a few programs uh, sponsored by the Public Health Agency of Canada. There are some new programs and a new focus from the uh, the Ministry for Families, Children and Social Development. Those focus seem to be focused mo mostly on early learning and access to childcare. Uh, Public Health Ontario also has several programs, but a lot of our work and work in um, public health and early child development seems to reside within our Ontario ministries of uh, children, community, social services, and uh, to some degree, the Ministry of Education and some overlap as well with um, municipal uh, strategies around this. So early on child and family centers. But uh, my involvement years ago uh, started with the enhanced 18 month well baby visit and has continued uh, with the developmental surveillance initiative. And I think by way of concept, and I don't think uh, these are um, this isn't new anymore, but um, we've appreciated over the last decade or more just the uh, profound relationship between brain and behavior, between the, the impact on uh, early life experiences and, um, and early child development, that there are important pathways to the development of uh, a brain development that impact on social, emotional, and motor, and language, and all aspects really of development. And that these earliest years actually have um, profound implications for the life of the organism, <laughs> the physical health, the mental health, and uh, the, the longitudinal trajectories as, uh, as we age and move from infants into uh, youth and adult and older age. So um, increasingly there's been an, uh, an appreciation of the importance of brain development in the early years and opportunities for early identification when there may be uh, issues and early intervention, if possible, to maximize everybody's developmental uh, potential. There are a lot of different factors that have been shown to influence early child development. Uh, these are just a few. Um, and so, you know, part of the strategy is what are the things that we can potentially optimize? Uh, again, are there things that we can recognize early in the developmental trajectory to try to intervene early to help to reduce those things that might be uh, barriers to healthy development and foster those things that might encourage child development. So that was part of the rationale that uh, led to, there was a task force in Ontario, there's been position statements and uh, the work from uh, Robin Williams, Jean Clinton and others to try to identify um, uh, an opportunity that could be built into primary care systems to have a, a more detailed conversation about development. And 
while it, it was recognized that this is important to have as early and often as possible, uh, the 18 month visit, which was one of the last uh, immunization, scheduled in, in immunization visits before uh, children would then be you know, uh, seen again you know, at the age of five before school started, the 18 month visit was selected as one that might be a pragmatic opportunity to have a more in-depth uh, what we refer to as the enhanced well baby visit with a deeper conversation about the child's development rather than just, oh, it's a well baby visit. We're going to weigh the child, give them their shot. It was, no, we really want to try to have uh, a more in-depth evaluation of the child's uh, development, social, emotional, motor on all, on all frames. So the province of Ontario uh, launched uh, a, a multi-faceted strategy around the enhanced 18-month well baby visit. And uh, the, the cornerstone of it in some ways is the use of standardized tools, uh, wanting people to have both a parent report tool as well as a standardized health professional checklist. So if you imagine that a parent might use a standardized reporting tool in Ontario, uh, for the most part that years ago, that was called the NDDS or the Nipissing. Uh, the, the new name for that is the look -see. But the, basically the use of a parent report tool that was asking questions about various aspects of development and then the Rourke baby record which is a checklist used by many primary care professionals across the country that would have sort of an in-depth uh, checklist including items related to um, social emotional behavioral development and evidence-based content around um, asking parents about various things. In addition, there was also uh, the development of a more organized early child development and parenting resource system that could also be used to foster it. And our role, our team's role, working in collaboration with uh, the Offord Center and INCH and other uh, key stakeholders, the Ontario College of Family Physicians, was really around developing some of the tools and the web portal. Uh, and it, at its simplest level, assess a child, uh, use these standardized tools, look for risk factors and concerns, provide support. Even if people are healthy, they may still benefit from education and community resources to continue to foster development, or they may or may not need some form of more intensive uh, referral to a specialist or another uh, program if there's other uh, identified issues, and then continue to monitor uh, to ensure that people uh, people's development is is going well, and that parents are less concerned. So again, our involvement started with a number of tools and resources for the parents and the public related to the eighteen month visit, as well as for healthcare professionals as part of the implementation of the enhanced eighteen month well baby visit, and. Uh, I guess things things went well on that front to some degree, and there was an interest in continuing to work on tools and resources and strategies that might enhance uh, early childhood development. So, um, just one other uh, tool to mention uh, is a planning tool that uh, parents use uh, known as the Visit Planner. So again, trying to look at what are some of the tools that could help a parent to engage in a more in-depth conversation. The visit planning tool is kind of a conversation aid to have that conversation about development at the enhanced 18-month uh, well baby visit. But Cal and John Kearney and the team at the Inch Lab were also interested in maybe more broadly applicable tools uh, beyond just the 18 month visit. And so that's part and parcel of some of the uh, things that we'll talk to you a little bit more about today. This is just a shot of uh, sort of the, it's not really an algorithm, but again, it's a, a guide for clinicians based on uh, the assessments that are happening at the enhanced 18 month well baby visit and whether universal services or whether there's a more primary concern that might benefit from additional community or provincial services. With that, I will hand it over to 
Calpan. Great. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Developmental Surveillance Initiative it's, and a deeper dive into what do we mean by surveillance, what is screening, what are the differences, why did we choose the approach of surveillance, uh, and then talk about the actual development of the tool, the validation, and then the implementation work. So really sort of taking you through from the beginning to the point that we're at today. Um, so this work, um, as Anthony mentioned, uh, was funded by the Ontario Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, and it was through their special needs strategy. Some of you might be aware this was a strategy that started a number of years ago. It had three different arms. Uh, we were focused on developmental surveillance and really the goal of early identification of children uh, to get them support sooner, because we know that early intervention is key and can really make a difference in children's lives. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about developmental surveillance? Uh, so developmental surveillance really looks at regular monitoring. So we're looking at something where we want to attend to parental concerns, we want to support family. It's an ongoing process. Um, but when we compare that to screening, screening is actually quite intentional. It's often one point in time and the, the, the main sort of focus of screening typically is identification and referral. So we want to identify, is there a delay? And then obviously refer for support and treatment. Whereas surveillance, it's much, it's much more of a process. So not one point in time, but really a process of engagement with a family to try to get a sense of where a child is at. And then if issues arise, support that parents to take support parents to take next steps. Um, there has been a number of position papers related to uh, early childhood screening that have come out in the, in the last few years. Uh, there was a paper that was published in 2015 that really said that we don't want to go the route of universal screening for children aged one to four, that the evidence didn't really support that approach. However, uh, in the case where parents had concerns or there was a suspicion of delay, then you want to, of course, follow that up. So really moving away from universal screening to taking a more surveillance approach. Um, there are a number, now while we do definitely, I should sort of say, there's definitely a role for screening. We are not saying that we want to sort of do away with screening altogether, but there are a number of challenges that we want to acknowledge uh, with a screening approach and, and surveillance can sort of tackle some of that. Um, we know that early childhood is really complex. There are many different domains uh, that children are growing and developing in, and we don't actually have good tools that tackle all of these areas together. Um, the context within a child's developing can make a difference. Is the child living in poverty? Um, uh, what sort of social supports do they have? All of that makes a difference. And then related to actual tools, two critical pieces that sort of uh, are problematic are most tools are milestone based. And so what we mean by that is, you know, parents may be asked to indicate whether their child can do a certain number of tasks um, at a certain point in time, at a certain age. Um, so for example, can your child speak 20 words? Are they able to catch a ball from four feet away? Sometimes parents will know the answer to this, sometimes they won't. And so part of the challenge with the existing tools is parents will guess about where their child is at. <laughs> Um, and then um, there's also the issue of age banding. Most tools are set up with discrete age bands um, and children may be at the top or bottom of that band and so might blur into age bands below or above them, but that can lead to misclassification. Um, and so those are, those are sort of issues with all screening tools, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge th those issues. Um, so again, I think we've covered some of this. Screening based at one point in time, we use one measure, one source of information. And, you know, we all know children in early childhood are, you know, temperamental. You get a child on a fussy day and, and if you do a screening tool, it may not accurately represent where they're at. But yet that tool might be used for referral purposes. So we were kind of thinking, is there a different approach? Is there, could we look at things in a different way? Um, this is a paper that uh, 
John Kearney and Heather Clark and myself wrote. And it really sort of talks about the underpinnings of our thinking related to developmental surveillance and developmental screening and wanting to look at what are the limitations and could we take a different approach? There's a link to that paper in the handout that you're receiving. And so you can sort of go there to get more detailed information. Um, what we put forward uh, what was something we call the 4M framework. So really wanting to look at surveillance in a holistic kind of way and wanting to look at um, an approach where we, what if we had many eyes, many times, many measures, many situations. And what we mean by that is, what if when we were assessing a child, we had different perspectives? So we had the perspective of the parents and maybe an early childhood ed educator. Maybe we were repeatedly sort of engaging with that child to sort of get multiple assessments over time. Maybe we use different measures. So maybe we were using observation as well as another tool. And then we were also looking at how the child behaved in different situations. How are they at daycare versus at home? Could we get a more holistic approach? And so that would get away from that one point in time screening um, challenge where children may be misclassi misclassified or misplaced based on that assessment. Um, I think we covered that. And so, our considerations for a new tool is we wanted something that would move away from having parents needing to have lots of knowledge about child development to be able to complete it. Something that would sort of uh, minimize the issue of age banding, um, that it had good domain coverage, so we had coverage of all different aspects of childhood development, and that we move it away from yes, no responses, because those are highly problematic, because because you will, you'll be forced to choose one response whether or not it's accurate. Um, so that's where we decided to think about a tool in a different kind of way. And what we ended up with is the early years check-in. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about the actual tool and then how it was developed. Um, so this is a screenshot of the tool. It is a very simple tool. It has 11 items. Uh, parents place a vertical line along this gradient to indicate their level of concern. Um, and a lot of thought actually went into the construction of the look of the tool. So when we did early face uh, uh, testing with parents, they mentioned things like um, they didn't want to circle a number. So it would feel very uncomfortable to say, I have a nine out of 10 in terms of my concerns. Uh, and so while there are kind of numbers underneath this, they're not visible to the parent. And so to simply put a line is much more palatable for a parent. They don't feel badly about their parenting and they don't feel badly about their child. Um, these are the items and they actually fall into four different domains. So we wanted to get good coverage of the range of developmental domains in early childhood. Um, I should mention that the early years check-in is developed for children 18 months to six years. So it's a wide range. And the, the language of each of the items is quite simplistic. Um, so that, and there is more detail in the implementation toolkit for parents in terms of what those items mean. But on the face of it, they're very simple and easy to understand. In terms of scoring, what happens is, so parents will indicate their vertical lines on each of the items. And then based on where they have the most number in uh, the low, elevated, or high, that determines which category they fall into. So if you have one elevated um, mark, that becomes your score, and if everything else is low. Um, and I should mention, and I think it's um, important to point out, uh, if you, let's say a parent indicates that they're concerned about how their child, their fine motor skills, that doesn't necessarily indicate that they have a delay or potential delay in that particular domain. This is a fairly blunt tool. So it just indicates that there is an issue in, in one of the domains, not necessarily tied to what the parent is indicating. So once you um, indicate your vertical check marks, you will get a scoring message that you are in the low elevated or high concerns sort of bucket. And then there are suggestions for how you would manage things for each of them. Um, oops. So I think we sort of talked about that. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about 
the development and testing of the tool. We had a fairly rigorous process in terms of the development of the tool. We um, wanted to make sure we developed something that was psychometrically sound. So that was really important that we didn't just sort of come up with items on our own and, you know, put them out into practice. So we did a lot of work with parents early on and educators and other providers to get their sense of what they would want included on the tool and what they, the tool should look like. So once we did some initial development of items and qualitative work, we developed our tool and then we did a pilot test. We did an early pilot test with three sites, uh, we had 63 children and 12 educators. So most of this early work happened in early on centers and licensed childcare centers. Uh, and then based on that initial pilot work, we actually tweaked some of the items that weren't performing so well. And then we did a broader validation study. Uh, and that ended up with about 200 children. Um, and we used that data to um, determine the cut points for that low elevated and high buckets. Um, we, in doing the, these two early phases, we actually had the parent complete the early years check-in. We had an educator complete the early years check-in. So we were wanting to get at that many eyes perspective. And then we had the child take part in a standardized assessment with the Baileys. So it's standardized. It's either completed by a trained assessor or a psychometrist, and it is designed to pick up delay. So those were the three different things, three sort of data points that we had during the validation study. Um, what we found when we did this work is uh, that the data from the educators actually did not line up well with the Baileys at all. So based on that, but the parents' data did. So based on that, moving forward, we recommended that this is a parent report tool. We don't recommend that someone else other than the parent complete the tool. Um, the validation work has been published. And again, there's a link for that in, in your handout where you can get more details about the psychometric properties and the cut points and information about sensitivity and specificity. Um, I do want to mention um, that the two thresholds that we came up with, sort of the high and the uh, the elevated, for the high category, we ended up with fairly decent sensitivity and specificity, but for that middle category, the sensitivity was adequate, but the specificity was not. Um, so you might be thinking, well, why would we move forward if that was the case? Well, that middle bucket really isn't for referral, referral but it's about monitoring and support. So we felt like we weren't sort of misleading anyone and that that bucket really represents how people would typically act in terms of when they engage with a, a parent in practice. Uh, but at the high cut point, we're fairly confident because the sensitivity and specificity was decent. Um, in terms of a little bit of information about the data from that validity study, who were the parents who had concerns? Well, they were more often born outside of Canada. They might've had a child who had a history of already having services. Um, and, and parents of male children. So people who fell in the higher concerned bucket, they tended to be from these categories. Um, so it's all it's great when you develop a tool, you go through the psychometric testing, you feel fairly confident that you've done a good job, stands up to sort of scientific rigor. But at the end of the day, we want people to use the tool. We want to get it into the hands of uh, practitioners and parents who will use the tool. And so we embarked on um, trying to understand how this tool worked in practice. So we did a process evaluation study to try to look at how would people use the tool, what worked well, what didn't, what would really support people to use the tool, really to tr try to make sure that when widespread implementation happens that we were supporting centers and parents to use it in a way that was useful for them. Um, so we had three different approaches to try to look at um, sort of process implementation. Uh, one, we actually sent out uh, tools to many different centers and had them use the tool in a way that they felt comfortable for them. So we're, we're not pres prescriptive in any way. We didn't say we need you to use the tool in this particular way. We wanted centers to think about their own practices, their own workflow and what might fit for them because we know from implementation science work, it has to fit within workflow. Um, we also had staff from our inch lab go into early on in licensed childcare centers and approach parents and ask them to complete 
the tool and then we followed up with them um, two weeks and three months later to find out did they do anything as a result of completing the tool. And then finally, we had Facebook advertisements um, online. So parents might get an ad about, oh, have you heard about the early years check-in? Would you be interested in completing it? Uh, and then if they responded back, we would send them the tool um, and a number of other questionnaires. And then again, did that same kind of follow-up. And so that Facebook advertising allowed us to um, get to parents who didn't go to early on centers or licensed child care centers. Um, we were able to engage centers from across the province. We had pretty good geographical dispersion. Um, we ended up with 80 sites. Most were early on centers and licensed child care centers, but we were really pleased that we were able to tap into other areas that we were wanting to get into. So we had um, a number of school readiness programs, kindergarten registration programs, one family health team, one public health unit, a family health team. So it was a little bit broader in scope. And so that was really helpful for understanding how could this tool be used in other settings. Um, for this part of the evaluation, we wanted all educators to take the online training course that Anthony will talk about shortly. So we had 203 educators trained. We sent out about 4,500 early years check-ins to the centers, and then we asked them to track what they did if they used the tool. And so we have data for 884 times the tool was used. Um, so what were the key ways that people actually use the tool? So many centers would use the tool at registration. So if you had a new family coming into your center, this was a great way to try to get to know them. So you might have them complete this tool along with the registration form. In licensed childcare centers, uh, some, some centers used it when a child moved between rooms. So a child might be moving from toddler to preschool room. And so as they move into the other room, they would get the parents to fill out the early years check-in to get a sense of, do you have any concerns that we should be monitoring? Providers would sometimes approach parents and ask them to complete it. Um, sometimes the tools were just sort of made available. They might have them in a pile, or maybe they put them in each cubby at daycare. Uh, and then obviously if a parent expressed a concern, this was an opportune time to say, oh, sounds like you've got some concerns about how your child is developing. We've got this new tool. Would you mind completing it? Uh, and in some cases at a home visit. Um, so how did educators and providers, what did they do as a result of uh, using the tool? So as you can see, by and large, you know, providers are doing what they would typically do. So about, you know, a little over, you know, 50% of the time, they're supporting parents, they're offering resources and materials related to early childhood development, which is what folks typically do in, in those type of settings. Um, sometimes they ask to check in again. So it might be something like, it sounds like you've got concerns. They may have a discussion and say, well, why don't we check back again in a few weeks and a few months to see how things are going. And then if you want to take further steps, we can do that. And then in about 7% of the time, um, a referral was made. 20% of the time, nothing happened. But the interesting point for us was 7% of the time a referral was made, and that coincides quite nicely with the high level of concern where we really would want uh, an educator or provider to support a parent to take the next step to look a little bit deeper into what is happening. Um, so what were some of the benefits that providers mentioned in terms of using the tool? Um, they by and large felt that it really did encourage conversation. So we really positioned the early years check-in as a tool to foster conversation uh, because that's the best way to help a parent take that next step. We know that parents are often uncomfortable if they feel like something's wrong. They might have that gut feeling that something's not quite right, but it's really hard to talk about. So this is one way to kind of break the ice and allow that conversation to happen. Um, so it was really helpful for families to identify where their concerns were. Uh, providers felt that it was well-designed, easy to use, um, quick, quicker than some other tools. Um, um, and this point, we were actually meaning that it helped to uh, provide some rapport with patients. So it really was a way to build a connection with a family through that conversation that would be happening. Uh, 
But of course, you know, nothing is perfect. We knew there would be issues along the way. We also know that this tool isn't for everyone. And we wanted to know what were some of the challenges? What were some of the difficulties that centers um, experience? So for some places, it was just logistically challenging. It was difficult to find that space, to have that conversation, to have a private conversation about, you know, if a child has an issue, that was, that was difficult in some places. Um, sometimes parents really just weren't interested. They didn't want to be approached to complete something. They came to the early on center to play with their children or attend a program. They really weren't interested in having a conversation or completing a tool. Um, some centers, in fact, there were uh, quite a few centers that already had a process in place. So they might be using the look-see or the ASQ or some other tool or process, um, and they didn't want to switch. So again, we know that's, that's challenging in implementation science. If you've got something that's working, it's really hard to switch over to something else. Um, and then finally, um, Providers indicated that, you know, while this is a tool that builds rapport, you also want to have a little bit of a connection with a family before you introduce the tool, because it can feel a little threatening to say, oh, hello, I just met you, and then offer them the tool. So um, having some kind of rapport with families was certainly helpful. Um, so after we did all of this work, what was our takeaway? How would we recommend using the early years check-in? So once you've got rapport with a family, this could fit in quite nicely in terms of having that conversation. In a licensed child care center, uh, when a child transitions rooms, that's a, that's a natural juncture to have a conversation with a parent, so it fits very nicely in. Um, encouraging all families to complete it. So what we mean by this is you might be running a parenting um, program and you've got 10 families attending, 10 parents attending. So maybe at the beginning of that group, you have all of the parents complete the tool. So you're not just singling out one family, it's everybody's completing it. this, and it's a great way to sort of open the door that this is a safe place to talk about childhood development. Centers that had a designated staff champion um, certainly felt that their implementation was stronger. Uh, and again, we know that's the case. We need people to sort of keep um, sort of championing new initiatives if we want them to succeed. Uh, so that was certainly helpful in some centers. Um, using the tool after a parent started to talk about a concern. So if a parent brought something up, you might bring out the tool so that they could look at the range of different developmental areas and that might prompt further conversation. Um, using it alongside other tools. So we're certainly not advocating that other tools aren't used. Uh, there were a number of centers who felt like this could be a great first step. So rather than having all families complete the ASQ or look-see, that maybe this is the first step. And then if, it, if there was high concerns, then maybe you move on to one of those other tools. Uh, and then that could help sort of drill down into where those concerns might lie. And then it could be helpful to use this with a physician or other health care provider. Um, that's certainly an area that we need to do more work on, but that was those were recommended sort of next steps for us. Cool. So what, yeah, why don't, why don't we pause there and uh, let's have a, uh, if there are any questions about uh, developmental surveillance, any questions uh, that you want to throw into the chat pod. Uh, I'm, I'm interested if this concept of surveillance and developmental surveillance is, is familiar to people. It, was this news today or is this uh, something that um, you, you've come across in your work before? And also any, any questions you have uh, about the EYCI tool itself. I did mention, I threw in the chat, there is both a, a printed version and there's an electronic version. And really uh, both have been put to use as part of the piloting and the evaluations for some of the, uh, the more detailed validity work. It was convenient to have the digital recording of the visual analog scale you know, concerns and, and uh, standardizing like uh, workflows related to filling it out. Uh, but I, I would say uh, for implementation, many of the centers, at least initially, we're using the printed version uh, of the tool. But um, yeah, if people have any questions around surveillance uh, or the EYCI or its its development, please, we're, 
we're trying to reach out in this vacuum right. of society. <laughs> you, can, you can't tell what people are thinking and feeling at home. So, Otherwise, we're just going to keep motoring on with other tools. So. How did it go with parents uh, where English wasn't their first language? Um, yeah, that is a great question. So we had the tool in English and French. Uh, so we were not able to use it with, you know, it wasn't translated into other languages. That being said, um, there were a number of centers whose population did not have English as a first language. And the, in those settings, the tool was definitely used alongside a educator who might have spoken the language of the parent who was there, who helped them sort of translate some of the wording. Now, the wording was quite simplistic, so that sort of helped. So I would say that it you know, would be best if we had translated versions in other languages, but the simplistic nature of the tool does lend itself well to being used if you have a provider who speaks the language of, of the client that they're working with so that they could sort of fill in some of the gaps. And another point here about uh, really liking the idea of surveillance versus, uh, you know, a single snapshot or a moment in time. And, and I will say, uh, I think that the concept of surveillance is uh, a little bit more flexible in, in that sense. And I, I think uh, it does resonate, I think, for physicians as well, the, the concept of ongoing monitoring. Uh, I, I I think this is an area like going back, you know, 10, 15 years ago with the initial implementation, part of the reason why we wanted to develop some of the other uh, tools and community resources is a lot of primary care providers were not necessarily fully aware of all of the uh, community resources or social services. So there was almost a bit of a silo between the the healthcare system and the child coming in for an 18 month visit and some of the other uh, provincial or community or social services around. So uh, that and the fact that there, I think a lot of physicians maybe didn't feel as comfortable with some of the other aspects of development. They may have felt comfortable with, you know, measuring head circumference or taking a child's weight or things like that. But they giving them some of these tools and also empowering them to be aware of some of the other community resources that could be used to help foster development. I think that not just the flexibility, but being able to uh, provide physicians with some tools as well. It's a little different from just the EYCI, uh, but I think the concept of surveillance is maybe uh, appealing for uh, primary care providers who will be following children and families longitudinally. Surveillance was a new concept to me, but totally makes sense. We're probably doing that informally, even though using screens. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually. Are we recommending that anyone who uses the tool with the family be trained in using it? Uh, I'm wanting to find a way to increase the conversation about child development with service providers that are already in place. For example, child welfare settings where a family support worker already working with the family could do the tool with the family rather than the family having to go to the child development center, thinking, thinking about increasing access or accessibility. I, I, what would you say about that, Cal? Because I would say, actually, the tool is very simple and it is a conversation guide. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the training around developmental surveillance and the EYCI is really more about awareness raising because I don't think there's really a lot of special training needed to use the tool. Um, sometimes people did raise the issue around it can be challenging as an early years professional to have a sensitive conversation about development with a parent um, so that you know the need for in communication skills in that domain is is useful. But I, I wouldn't say the, the EYCI really needs any special training in that sense. No, I think, I mean, I think the training that you've developed, Anthony, would be quite, I mean, that sort of sets the stage for the background of the tool and why we want to take a surveillance approach. But uh, I think in that setting, that would actually work really well to help foster that conversation. 
Another great question here. Does the tool ask about uh, ACEs, also known as uh, adverse childhood experiences? And it does not. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a really good point, though. I, I didn't talk specifically about from a public health standpoint or brain and, and behavior or child development. But we now know there's a pretty strong relationship between uh, adverse childhood experiences and child development that re results in a range of different health outcomes, mental health outcomes, and really alters the trajectory. But uh, no, that that is not specifically asked for. It just focuses uh, more on, well, we can show the items uh, again later, uh, but yeah, questions related, not related to adverse childhood experiences. And I would add that we really see the tool as a beginning step, like the start of an ongoing sort of process and relationship with a family. So it is it is quite simplistic in its kind of look and its use, but hopefully that's the stepping stone to having those more difficult conversations with a family about what they're thinking about and, and providing that space for a family to do that. Because I think what we heard and what really sort of helped move us in this direction is that it's difficult for providers and it's difficult for families. It's really, really tough to say, I think there's something wrong with my child. I see them on the playground and you know, other children can do this and my children can't. Or And to, to articulate that out loud is really difficult for a lot of parents. They feel judged. They feel like they're doing something wrong. So to have something that can open that door to having that conversation in a safe and sort of non-judgmental way. Um, so this is the start. And then hopefully from that, it leads to sort of talking about things like how ACEs can impact or other issues that may be at play. Another uh, question from the Q&A, do dedicated developmental and referral initiatives exist in other provinces or other countries? And have these initiatives been evaluated? Good question. I mean, it's so specific region to region, right? In terms of what those referral pathways are. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the range of tool. I mean, you you and the team at Inch did evaluate a lot of different tools out there to see if there were other screening tools that would be useful. I remember in the initial days for the enhanced eighteen month well baby visit too, we were looking at whether there were more standard you know tools in the toolkit that could be recommended yeah. based on evidence and what's interesting I, I guess is uh while there was a group around the the periodic task force that came out saying there was no role for universal screening this is where i think surveillance as a more flexible monitoring of development comes in but i i'm not sure to answer that person's question, I, I, I think, you know, it was scanned to see if there were any other obvious kind of initiatives. I think some were being done as pilots in different communities, possibly around particular conditions, but not necessarily an overall one. In, in the U.S., for example, they had an initiative in Oregon that was quite similar in some ways to using like a visit planner uh, I can't remember if they called it the the well baby planner or something like that. So uh, fairly comparable in terms of trying to encourage a standardized sort of conversation guide that would plan ahead of uh, a, an early child well well baby visit. Um, but I I don't think it's had widespread uptake. Um, I was wondering if you had any special considerations for Indigenous children on off reserve if these children were included in any of the pilot or, or validation studies. Um, we did a little bit of initial work uh, with some Indigenous centres to get their perspectives early on. Um, I think as we move through the project, we recognise that we actually needed to do more work in that area. Like we, we, we know that one size doesn't fit all and we couldn't really do justice to um, indigenous families by, you know, so I think more work needs to be done in that area. Um, they were included in the initial focus groups that led us to thinking about sort of domains and wording and that kind of thing. 
but not through the validation work. Uh, another uh, point in Quebec, we're using the 18 month old vaccination and referring to a more adapted screening program called Agir Tôt. And uh, uh, Emily's put in uh, agirto.org or agirto.org slash English. Interesting. We will definitely check it out. Yeah, and again, I think uh, some of the some of the challenges around uh, screening, you know, when it when uh, that periodic task force did a fairly exhaustive systematic review, I believe that was uh, looking at the evidence uh, through uh, high quality studies uh, in children maybe aged one through four, mm -hmm. and they could not uh, f not substantiate the evidence for any universal screening of like all children. Uh, but again, that's not surveillance and the flexibility and the importance of surveillance to continue monitoring. And, and I think, you know, the work that uh, you and, and others did, Cal, really helped to validate parental concerns as a really important uh, thing. I mean, uh, on the one hand, we can pay lip service to, you know, family centered care. But I think there's maybe a bit of a history of not necessarily um, like of maybe sometimes being dismissive of parental concerns. And I think some of your work to validate the, the accuracy of the parental concerns actually mapped more to uh, some of the other standardized tools like the Baileys. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't. I don't know how relevant it, it is. the The CDC has an app that, as a parent of young kids, I've been using um, called mm. Mile, Milestones. Um, so you know, every two months for the first year, and then every every I don't know, eighteen months, two years, three years, four years, they have just a checklist for parents to do before those appointments. Um, but I I don't know. I just checked it actually now. I'm not sure exactly what evidence mm. it's actually based on, but um, it's neat. It goes through things, gives you a little video of what should look like and, and then asks you and then um, you can flag things to bring up with your physician when you do have that appointment so great, great. well I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, thank you very much everybody those are some yeah. really good questions and points and uh, hopefully I'm gonna talk fast enough that we have a little more time for discussion as well on some general points I, I just wanted to walk through a couple of the other tools that were developed to uh, kind of complement the EYCI. So um, Play and Learn is one of them, and it is a uh, website and a subscription service, which I'll explain in a moment, with games and activities that uh, parents can do at home. And again, the age range that we're shooting for here is the same as the EYCI. So for children 18 months to six years of age. And the rationale here, in some ways, it, it was always the intention that the EYCI was more about this opportunity to have a conversation about development and foster and support parent education to better understand the child development. So this was a very practical idea that was always seen sort of hand in hand as a, a tool to accompany the EYCI. Practical ideas, games and activities, uh, complement the EYCI and actually mapped to the various domains that, um, that the EYCI kind of uh, assesses. The, the approach, uh, I've, I've divided the approach here on the one hand, uh, you know, Cal and the team at the Inch were basically uh, doing a deeper dive on um, other sites and activities and games that uh, were appearing uh, in a variety of areas that might be loosely age banded and had some kind of uh, evidence to support their use or the domain that it was touching on. And then in terms of the actual design and development of the Play and Learn website, um, we incorporated uh, end users uh, to help with the design of the user interface and the user experience, that's the UI and UX abbreviations, uh, where possible and over time we would uh, develop out multimedia, whether those were images to help people understand how to implement an activity or videos. 
And then uh, over time, again, with feedback, we added a, an email-based campaign where once a week, somebody could subscribe to receive uh, an activity uh, based on their child's age band. And soon we'll be deploying a, a text message-based uh, version of that. So this can be used as dis as a standalone resource, and we've had uh, people who are putting in, you know, games or activities in their parent newsletters, or just referring people to uh, play and learn. And again, the link is in uh, the handout. Um, but uh, some of the registered ECEs might also recommend a specific game or activity. I think uh, Cal, uh, w during the implementation, some were printing out their favorite activities related to domains and might give the handout. Um, and then when you complete the EYCI, it will actually send at the end, after you submit the online version of the EYCI, it will identify games and activities in the domain of highest concern that you've identified. So it's structured based very loosely on these age groups of toddler, preschool, and kindergarten. Um, once you're in an age band, it also has the different domains. So again, you might be interested in something focused on movement, if that's an area of concern, or social and emotional. So all of the games and activities are grouped into those uh, domains. Um, there's actually some information and parent education on the domain within each of the landing pages. And then this is an example of some uh, of a video example, but the, it, you know, within thinking and learning, you might have just a small amount of content about it. We may well be expanding some of the educational content in that uh, if for each of the domains. And then this is an example of a, of a close up on an activity that does have a video, uh, gives a description of it. You can see other activities in the domain and other topics for the age band. And if you, if you scroll down, these are standardized things like how do you set it up? What's the time required? What materials do you use? And we tried to find things that were readily accessible, things you wouldn't have to go out and buy special tools. How do you play it? Some tips to some tips generally, and also how to make it uh, easier or harder if you need to adapt or accommodate it for your child. And then and then the reference. So that kind of standard structure is, is there for each of the games and activities. And then as I explained the, the whole uh, weekly subscription, uh, this is an example of um, an activity for a kindergarten child that I subscribe to uh, called Balloon Balance. And um, we've had, I think, over 4,500 uh, subscribers so far, and we're uh, now going to uh, test out uh, whether people are uh, keen to sign up for the text message version. And there's some interesting data out there on uh, the success rates in the US in some communities with uh, text messaging uh, for for education around uh, child development. Uh, post campaign uh, surveys that we've done have uh, indicated really uh, excellent feedback. And uh, this is a nice testimonial, testimonial uh, that somebody loved the simple, quick activity ideas that you can try without much preparation when there's downtime in the house. And of course, downtime in the house is the theme of this pandemic for many parents. So actually, uh, while these tools were all developed pre-pandemic, uh, the advantage of being able to engage people um, on on both uh, you know online for the EYCI or play and learn. So uh, the US and Canadian site, uh, that US initiative with text messaging was a totally separate uh, study that was done years ago. So um, in no matter which jurisdiction you're in, the website for Play and Learn, which again is in the handout, planlearn.healthhq.ca, you can access that from anywhere, no matter what jurisdiction you're in. The online training program, I'll just speak to very briefly. Um, uh, the concept here was to develop an asynchronous online course, uh, which can be accessed at uh, dsi.machealth.ca. You just 
set up your own free account on Mac Health, and then you can log in to access it. And uh, it provides a bit of an overview, some of the same background we've talked about in terms of what's developmental surveillance and um, you know what it is, what it isn't, as in an overview of the EYCI. Uh, there's some uh, kind of scenarios, like the mini one that I started at the beginning, but different uh, scenarios about how someone might use the EYCI with, uh, with a parent or a grandparent and uh, to foster that conversation and uh, does uh, track uh, in our learning management system completion and is also available uh, in French as well. Uh, again, in terms of the design and the development, this is uh, probably our uh, area of strength around how to design online learning experiences using best practices in evidence-based multimedia learning. So uh, you would go through and there's visuals, there are animations where appropriate to illustrate uh, the parent interactions, uh, various uh, scenarios, as I mentioned, there's a virtual coach, Antonio, who has nothing to do with me. And uh, this, this you know, all of the, the properties that we design also use what's called responsive design. So play and learn, EYCI, or the e-learning for professionals can all be used on a range of different uh, devices. And uh, so far, we've had great feedback on the course. For the most part, implementation was done within the pilot and the validation studies that Cal spoke about. But we have had over 500 course completions to date, a high degree of satisfaction, and 100% agree that they would recommend the course to a colleague. And it was interesting. We had many people who had uh, worked for many years in early childhood education who found that they were actually learning new things, like the concept of developmental surveillance, I think, is not, um, you know, not necessarily uh, something that everybody is familiar with. So... Uh, we're currently working on a second course related to a new tool. Uh, so the implementation toolkit was uh, designed um, based on some of the feedback that uh, uh, Cal and others got around uh, the pilot testing and the implementation process evaluation. What it is, is a PDF document available in both English and French. And it's really a comprehensive guide to to support implementation of EYCI and play and learn in practice, and maybe fills in a few of the other uh, questions that people had about how could I use it? How were we using it? Uh, gives more uh, real life examples, tips and case studies. Uh, so there's also promotional tools that can be printed out like posters that could be used in an early year center. Uh, this is just an example of the cover and uh, the table of contents. It can be downloaded from dsi.machealth.ca as well. Um, and uh, there's a few neat things, as I mentioned, various promotional uh, print materials that can be used or PDFs that could be emailed uh, to parents. And then uh, there's also an, uh, a conversation tracker, which was one of the things. Um, the the uh, I, I mentioned uh, register, uh, registered ECEs for the training, but basically any paraprofessionals or anyone interested in developmental surveillance uh, can register to go through the online training and anybody can use the EYCI. So these all of these tools that we've mentioned today are open access and you don't have to be a registered ECE. Anybody can create a free account on Mac Health and uh, check out the DSI uh, course. Uh, same with using the EYCI, nobody's going to, uh, nobody's restricted from that. So uh, Cal, I don't know if you wanna say a little bit more about sure. your evolution of the toolkit as well. Um, so we embarked on doing some evaluation of the toolkit before it was finalized. So really with all of the different parts and pieces of these initiatives, we really want to make sure that what we develop fits for the user. So we're not going to develop something and just sort of put it out there. We want to make sure 
that it fits, it makes sense, uh, are there changes that people would make? So we did two different things. We um, set the toolkit to 20 different sites across the province and we asked them to use it for eight weeks. And then along with that, we also did parent focus groups to get feedback for the parent related um, tools that are in the toolkit to get their thoughts and impressions. Um, I should say, um, we started this last year and then COVID hit in the middle of that eight week test period. So some centers were not able to use it for the full eight weeks, some used it for a portion, some not at all. But we still did do um, follow-up interviews to get people's impressions and during those interviews walked people through the different components. Uh, the focus groups with parents were very informative. You know, parents are great. They will tell you very honestly what they like and don't like. Um, <laughs> we develop a thick skin in research. So, um, so that was actually really helpful. So we were able to modify and update documents based on what parents said because again ultimately when you develop something you want people to use it and if the parent says you know what that's four pages long I barely have time to open my mail I can't read four pages I need it to be one page or one page back in front those are things that you want to pay attention to so that all helped to inform the revision of the toolkit to what it is now um, there are a number of next steps that were suggested. Um, translation of the early years check-in and supporting documents into other languages. That's always been sort of top of mind in terms of how can we get broader reach for the tools that we've developed. Um, continued development of online tools. That really seems like an area that's appealing to many people, that they can be at home and access all of these materials. And then further engagement with primary care and public health. You know, we've done great work with early years, Ontario Early Years Centres, licensed childcare. So I think continuing to find ways to engage with primary care and public health are definitely directions for the future. So we're, uh, this is a good time just to open it up uh, again more broadly for uh, any questions. I, uh, the handout has all of the links to everything we've talked about, but I did throw the link into uh, Play and Learn because there's a question about uh, US and Canadian sites. So it's, it's all just the one, uh, the one site for Play and Learn. Um, so yeah, feel free to throw any other questions. I know we had a, that was a really good discussion after the EYCI and I appreciate people uh, sending in their uh, questions, comments, and we'll definitely also check out the Agir mm -hmm. I know there's another really good uh, uh, site in Quebec with uh, excellent child information. I'm trying to remember uh, the name of it, but uh, Nessir or something, but um, yeah, any other Questions, comments? I think from a implementation standpoint, uh, you know, the next period of time for us will be really focused on that as, as Kalpan is saying, there's been a lot of work that has gone into uh, development and refinement and the toolkit and, uh, you know, a, a, a wide variety of other, um, a wide variety of other uh, tools to support implementation. And uh, now we're uh, beginning to have a lot more conversations with uh, new groups who have only just been introduced to the tool, like some of the other early on child and family centers that maybe didn't participate in some of the the pilot evaluations or validity studies. So there's uh, there's still uh, a lot of work being done. Uh, there was a request to put up the four domains again. So I will try to rapidly navigate with the slideshow navigator to find that slide. Oh, I'm gonna, I'll, I think I'm gonna find it faster, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Ah, got it. There we go. There's there's the uh, the four broad domains. Um, the other the other uh, slide that we didn't spend too long on was near there was the actual eleven items. But uh, the items again are worded. Th those are the items, and they're clustered into their uh, their domains. And then the eleventh item is the general one on overall. Uh, how would you 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 know generally do you have concerns about this child's development? So 
Uh, yes, that was the site, Emily. Netre grandir. Thank you. And we have props for the webinar platform as well. <laughs> Always glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else that you wanted to say, Cal, about the domains specifically? I know there was a pretty rigorous, you know, again, uh, uh, overview evaluation of a large number of uh, different other tools out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and trying to you know kind of uh, focus and cluster the domains. They're not they're not actually um, you know clustered officially on the EYCI, uh, but it, I think it was meant to ensure that there was at least some comprehensiveness around coverage of yeah. uh, those domains. And then it it uh, we used that information to map domains of concern to uh, educational content, games and activities on play and learn. Yeah, and I think the one thing I would add is, you know, while we have put each of the items into a domain, we know that they do cross over domains as well. It's really difficult, you know, you know, someone expressing emotion or gets along with others can also relate to language. So, I mean, there's definitely things that cross over, but we did our best to try to fit it into sort of where it might sort of best land. Um, there's definitely sort of connectivity between all of the different domains. Yeah, that's a, uh, we have a comment that uh, Terry's excited to explore the play and learn activities with parents. This is great instead of just listing activities and I, and I would agree with you and I think some of the folks that have commented on you know putting specific activities in newsletters uh, I think it's the same thing sometimes as physicians when we have like vague uh, admonitions to patients like oh you know be physically active or ex you know this is a more specific type of recommendation it's like try this specific activity, here's how you can do it. If it's too hard, here's how you can make it easier. Uh, so I, I think it is, uh, it's nice to uh, be specific with a recommendation to try it out. Um, Stephanie's wanting to know if we published the scoping work done on the screening tools and uh, the publications are referenced in the handout. Uh, there's the, the one uh, that outlines, I guess the, no, but I guess Stephanie's asking specifically yeah. on screening tools, yeah. Um, I don't think it's in the handout, Stephanie, but uh, there was some earlier work done by John Kearney and other folks at Inch related to looking at the validity of the NDDS, as it was known at the time. That work was published. It was known as the PAN study, but we can uh, uh, try to get that link out to you. Um, so that actually looks at that particular tool uh, and its psychometric properties, but not sort of a scoping review in terms of, you know, all the tools that are out there. The other one that I do wonder, though, is the periodic task force one. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that systematic review. Yeah, and I might be able to find that. That was a... I, I CMAJ paper, I think from 2015, is that right? Uh, I, oh, I think I found it. 2016? Oh, 2016, okay, no? yeah. Has the time really uh, flown that fast? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this, I, I, cause the one that we were looking at recently, um, was actually a, yes. a, a different one. Oh, that was the, the physician focused one. Maybe. Decided. That was a 2017. The, I guess one of the articles that I referenced in the handout, though, is also the really important commentary on, okay, so, you know, screening, universal screening may not have been validated, but let's not forget the importance of developmental surveillance. And I think that was uh, Robin Williams and uh, co-author. So, um, so, so I, anyway, all of the links are in the handout. I'm, I'm going to, um, move to the big finish. 
uh, now, but it's going to take me a while to navigate <laughs> and navigate back through all of the the slides. While you're doing that, Anthony, I just want to uh, make one quick comment. You mentioned John Kearney earlier, and I think we would be remiss not to sort of note that he really was the originator of the work related to the early years check-in. You know, he had had a long-standing relationship with the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And really it was out of the sort of work validating the tool, the NDDS, that the earlier check-in and subsequent work happened at the Inch Lab that he had sort of founded many years ago. He's now based in Australia, but really did a lot of the foundational work. Yeah, we all really love him. I'm not sure why we shipped him to I Australia know. exactly, yeah. but he seems um, remarkably happy there. Yes. So. I, I can't hold that against him. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess key points, we have a chance, uh, the EYCI, a flexible tool designed to support this flexible concept of developmental surveillance with children 18 to six, uh, can be 18 months to six years of age, can be used and predominantly is recommended as a conversation aid, really guiding conversations related to parental concerns to help foster education and early child development. Uh, these additional tools like play and learn uh, are available that offers expert reviewed games and activities, uh, the implementation toolkit, the e-learning, and uh, some of the other associated resources in the toolkit can all be used to help with implementation. Uh, work continues with respect to implementation and evaluation. And we know there are some other provinces that are uh, talking right now. I've had some conversations as has the ministry with uh, Nova Scotia. So I think there is a broader interest. And I, I think the pandemic has also created an interest in high quality resources that can be recommended to parents uh, that they can access online if they're uh, not able to, uh, to come into a center. Uh, relevant links, again, all of these are in the handout, uh, including those, uh, the EYCI rationale and, and validation study. And uh, I mean, Cal, I think you mentioned it, the, the acknowledgements here, uh, John, you, Heather, uh, Christina, like there's a lot of people involved with this over the years. McMaster in the earliest years, like Gene Clinton had a major involvement with the uh, the rollout of the enhanced 18 month well baby visit. And uh, we've had others uh, from our team within the division of e-learning. I'd be remiss not to mention our lead programmer, uh, John Bousfield for the work that he's done on the visit planner and the EYCI and uh, play and learn. And then uh, Lori Mosca from our team as well has been heavily involved. And again, uh, much thanks for uh, funding by the government of Ontario, in particular, the, the Ministry of uh, Children, Community Social Services, and a lot of hard work over the years by their team of professionals to uh, help with this work. And again, they, they can get credit, but no blame, uh, which has to fall. Uh, to all of us. So I apologize if I've left anybody out of the uh, acknowledgements. So thank you very much for having us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony and Kapana. That was a, a tremendous um, amount of, of work synthesized into this webinar. And this was this was really fantastic and well prepared. Um, we do thank you so much for taking the time to, to share this with the audience today. Um, what we'd like to do now is get a little bit of feedback from, from the audience members. Um, uh, know that the feedback will remain anonymous um, and uh, everything gets synthesized into or aggregated into to overall scores and we just use this to uh, uh, continually improve our, our webinars and our products. So um, we're just um, wondering if, if the webinar helped inform um, your knowledge and understanding of using evidence in order to make uh, practice decisions. Um, so we'll wait a, a couple of seconds for, for responses to come in on this one. Um, and just want to make sure I can't quite see. Oh, there. Um, so it looks like most responses have come in. Thank you. Um, seeing some really positive responses. Really, really glad to see that. Um, the next question is um, whether you would be using today's um, the information from today's webinar in your own practice. Um, whether you feel that this is something that would apply directly to what you are, are working with. Um, so that has opened up now. Um, so please make sure that you select your answer um, and that you hit submit so that your answer does get uh, does get recorded. 
Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to, to answer these. Um, I see responses are coming in. I'll give it another couple of seconds. Perfect. Um, and then I believe um, two more questions. The second last one is um, how you felt about today's webinar. Um, you can check all that apply here, um, whether you felt the webinar was relevant to uh, your and uh, your public health practice, uh, whether it was effectively facilitated, if there were opportunities for participation, um, if it was easy to follow, and if it met your, your overall expectations for the webinar. Um, so you can select as many of those as you like and uh, hit submit in the blue button at the bottom there. So we're seeing some responses come in. This one takes an extra couple of seconds. So uh, thank you so much for, for providing the feedback uh, for us today. It is definitely helpful. And great. And then the last question that we have for today um, is whether or not we could contact you in the future to discuss how we can improve our webinar series. Um, so if if you do mark a yes here, we can we can trace you back to your registration. If not, uh, we, we will not do that. Um, so again, you can select your answer and just hit submit at the bottom there. Um, and that's great. I'm seeing the responses come in. So um, I do encourage everybody in the audience, um, once you get a moment, to, to check out the other webinars that we have uh, from the NCCMT. We have another few this uh, coming up later this month um, on evidence-informed decision-making, I think, related to policy. Um, and then early in March, we'll be holding an online journal club where we'll critically appraise a rapid review together. Um, so rapid reviews have emerged as a, um, a really key type of synthesized evidence uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, but there are, of course, some limitations and caveats to, to looking at these, the findings of a rapid review. So we'll do a critical appraisal and, um, and see um, how, how that should inform uh, key recommendations from a, a rapid review. Um, so I thank everybody uh, once again for joining today, um, and especially our presenters, uh, Dr. Levinson, Dr. Nair. Um, for more information about MT, you can check out our website, uh, nccmt.ca. Um, and if you have any questions, follow-up questions for, for us or for the presenters, um, please contact us at nccmt.mcmaster.ca. We can make sure that we get you in touch with, with the presenters as well. Um, so huge thank you again um, to, to Anthony and Kalpana. I'll hand it back to you for, for um, um, for goodbyes and uh, thanks to everybody. I uh, hope everybody's staying warm. <laughs> Take care. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily and NCCMT. Big fan of NCCMT and uh, really appreciate everybody's uh, questions and interactions and feedbacks in the chat this afternoon. So thank you. Great. Hi, Echo, Anthony, Sentiments. It was great to have the interaction and feedback and thanks for all the comments. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Wishing you all the best.